Good morning and welcome to Money Matters to God Saturday. Money Matters to God Saturday. My name is Sean Isaacs and today I want to discuss the subject of when and why giving away your talents, your treasures, and your time is or could be unwise. There are times when you and I give away our talents, time, and treasures in an unwise way, in a way that is not prudent, a way that lacks discretion, a way that reveals that we are simple-minded. And this is especially true in the area of ministry and or business. Uh, you know the scriptures, if you're a child of God, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so, yes, since Christ tells us that it's more blessed to give than to receive, why is it that I would say that there are times, especially if you are in business, when giving away your time, talents, and or treasures re reveals that you are unwise, reveals that I am unwise. And so that's what I'm going to seek to tackle today. Uh, right up front, who is this for? Well, this is for anyone who has value in education, value in treasures, value in talents. By talents, I mean that you have been gifted by God to provide a service to the marketplace. Maybe your talent is you are an attorney. Your talent may be today that you're a nurse, you're a doctor. Your talent may be that you are a banker, you're a, you're a sales professional. Your talent may be that you are a business consultant, a coach, a network marketer. You have something to give to the marketplace to enhance the life of others. That's your talents. We're not to bury our talents. But I'm going to share it today when giving away talent is unwise and wrong. Now, if you're a child of God, you understand that there is tension, especially when you are in business and or ministry. Because in either of those capacities, you are a servant. When you are in business... As a child of God, if you understand it correctly, you are actually doing ministry because you are serving others. When you are in ministry, you are serving others in whatever capacity, capacity, capacity that is. All right. So what I want to do today is I want to share when giving is wrong. I want to share times when um, when you and I think we're being Christ like we think we're being good Christians. We think we're doing the right thing, but we're actually dealing with a slack hand. And I learned this the hard way many, many years ago when God blessed me in the first year of a business, a building materials company. My first year I built that business to $1.2 million in sales the first year. Now, for many, that's not a big feat. That doesn't sound like a great thing to do, but let me give you some context. The business was started with about $8,000. It was in a community of 25,000 people or less. And three of my major competitors had been in business for 30 years. They were advertising on television, radio, uh, newspaper. There was no social media then. There was no real live. Uh, there was no internet, which is used often to build business. And yet that business built, I was able to build that business by the grace of God and through the wisdom of scripture to $1.2 million in sales, 17 employees later. A few years later, that business, I had to close that business and it put my family and I $100,000 in debt. And it was one of the worst things that happened to us at the time. But looking back now, it was one of the best things that happened to me. Because I got to learn the hard way that giving away treasures and talents and time is not always a good thing. Just because the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive doesn't mean that in business you should do ministry. And I see this happening often among many of God's people who are in business, who are entrepreneurs, who are looking to launch a product or service. We think we're being good Christians or we're being more like Christ or more godly by giving away, quote unquote, our services for free. I want to share with you why that's a bad idea and how to change your heart in that area, and then how to, how to marry heart with head. What I learned after the closing of that business is that he that deals with a slack hand will come to poverty. If you deal with a slack hand, God says you will come to poverty. All right, so let me begin with prayer this morning, and uh, I'm going to seek to deal with this topic on when and why 
giving away your products and your services, your time, your treasures, money that God has blessed you with is unwise. It's not smart. It is not Christ-like. It lacks prudence. And you are not being less of a Christian when you exercise discretion and prudence. All right, so we're going to seek to jump into this for the next few moments. If you're new to this, um, if you're new to this concept, um, if you're new to Saturdays, I call Saturdays uh, Money Matters to God Saturday. Every Saturday, I seek to get on live, Facebook Live, and talk about money and the Bible and how God sees money. If you're new to the subject of the Bible, maybe you're uncomfortable uh, with money. A lot of God's people are uncomfortable with talking about money, uh, uncomfortable with dealing with the subject. And maybe if we wrote the Bible, we would not have 2,500 plus verses in the Bible dealing with the subject of money. We probably would talk more about heaven, more about um, spiritual things than we would about money. But money is spiritual from God's perspective. Money is a spiritual thing. It has the value that you and I give it. And so we're going to look at this sub subject and topic this morning, and I pray that, um, that you'll hang out with me for a few moments and find some help. And if you know anyone that's a Christian entrepreneur, network marketer, business owner, someone who is a sales professional, works in an industry or capacity where they serve others and receive compensation of some sort by giving their time, their talents, or treasures, I'm going to encourage you to tag them because there may be some information here that can be helpful to them, all right? So I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help us during this time. Again, we're going to seek to answer the question, why giving away your time, treasures, and talents is unwise? You should also tag anyone that's in ministry, because this can be helpful. And I'm, I want to tell you right up front, I'm not interested in building my brand. That's not the purpose of doing this. Uh, you'll notice on my Facebook page that under my intro... I have these words, that the Christian marketing expert whose motto is to be a go-giver, not a go-getter, expecting nothing in return. Or, Facebook doesn't allow me to put all the words, but the point is, for years, that's been my motto. I give, expecting nothing in return. Well, Sean, isn't that a contradiction? You give, expecting nothing in return, and yet you say, giving away your time, treasures, and talents is unwise? Yes, I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning for the privilege to be able to come into your presence. Your word reminds me that in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I thank you that there are that there is satisfaction and contentment in your presence, that I don't need anything or anyone or any words of others. I don't need the support of anything or anyone. When I have your smile, when I have your presence, when I, have, when I am encouraged in my inner being that you are with me, as your word says, I will never leave nor forsake you. And I pray that for all of us that belong to you, all of us that are your children, that you would teach us, Lord, how to find satisfaction in you. I want to pray especially for our government and our administration. In this season right now where there is uncertainty, and things are happening in Syria and other parts of the world. I'm just asking, Father, as you have commanded us to pray for those that are in authority, that we may live a peaceable life here. And so I'm asking, Father, that you would give to the Congress and Senate and others, and may they learn how to walk in the fear of God and make decisions that would be in, in, line, in line and in keeping with your sovereign rule, your desire, and your will for this world. I know that you are working all things after the counsel of your will. And so I have no concern, no fear, no doubt. I am in total confidence, Lord, at the heart. And I'm asking, Father, that as I take the next few moments to deal with this subject, Father, that money matters to you and how it should impact every area of our life and how that when we learn how to spend money, how to earn money, how to use money, how to invest money, how to save money, that all these things are spiritual actions. And when we do these things, we give greater honor and glory to you when they're done in a manner that's wise and prudent and demonstrates that we are exercising discretion. Let your will be done on earth, even now, Lord, as it is now done in heaven. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Why giving away your time, treasures, and talents is unwise. Three reasons why it's unwise. Number one, you lose the heart. Number two, you lose value. And thirdly, you lose time. First of all, giving away time, treasures, and talent. Let me define what I mean by those three words. Time. Well, time obviously is easy to define. Time is the most valuable asset in the world next to the soul. Jesus says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The soul is the most valuable thing that you and I possess. The soul is not our body. The soul is who and what we really are. The soul is what lives on when the physical body goes to the grave. Next to the soul, there is nothing more valuable in this life than time. Time. The Bible says things like um, that tomorrow is promised to no one. Time is more valuable than money. Time is more valuable than talents or gifts. Time is more valuable than treasures. And so valuing time is critical. Jesus says things like we must work while it is day. For the time will come when you will not be able to work. And so work is something that has a season. We don't ha always have opportunity to work. And so first of all, if you're working in the kingdom, that time will eventually run out. But physical work has a season. There comes a point in a time when you can't work. And this is why you and I should value the treasures that we're able to earn with that time. Because there come a time when you'll look back on your life where you say, you know what, I used to make a lot more money. I lack the capacity because of my age, because of my energy, because of my health. I can't do as much work. And so I give less value to the marketplace. And so I don't get as much money from the marketplace. And by that, I'm not making as much money as I could. And so time is extremely valuable. Then we have our treasures. Treasures. Treasures are not just possessions. Treasures are things that you and I value. Treasures can be our family. Treasures, obviously, at the lowest level is money, right? The Bible says things, the Bible says things like where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will be. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be. So what are treasures? Treasures are things that, that we value, people that we value, things that are important to us. At the lowest level, again, it is the money and our material possessions that are our treasures. But treasures are more than that, and we'll seek to apply that to how it should impact the way you and I do business, ministry, and, and everything else that we've been called to. And then there's talents. Talents would be our gifts. Talents would be the things that God has given us. Talents are not just things that we are born with, like I can sing, that's a talent. A talent is not just that. Talent is things that we are able to nurture. Talent becomes skill sets. And so the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, who has made you to differ? In other words, Paul is by the Spirit of God, speaking to the Corinthians who are divided, who are saying, I am of Paul. Another says, I'm of Peter. One says, I am a Lutheran. Another says, I'm a Calvinist. The other is, I'm a Methodist. And they're divided from one another. They have an ear of superiority over their brother or their sister in Christ. And it keeps division between them. And God reminds them to be humble because everything that they have, even in, the, in uh, uh, something as simple as the knowledge they have that they use to distinguish themselves from one another. God says that who has made you to differ from another? In other words, everything that we have, everything that we possess is given by God. There is nothing that you and I have or possess that's not given by God. That doesn't mean that we don't work for it. It doesn't mean that there's not effort, effort employed to get it. It doesn't mean that you and I should, don't actually possess it. That's a tension in scripture. God owns everything, yet I have things that can be stolen in their mind. And so there's tension in scripture that God owns everything, yet I own what I work for and what I uh, spend time and money and energy for or invest in. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? You hear the question? There's nothing that you and I have that we did not receive. If we possess health, 
We received that because God either gave us the wisdom of what foods to avoid, what nutrition to add to our body, what things, and on and on we can go. I don't want to, di I don't want to divert from our topic. All right? So there's nothing that you and I have that we have not received from God. So when is it unwise or foolish and even harmful and hurtful to give away your time, your treasures, and or your talents? Well, number one, when you and I, we lose the heart in general when we give away time, talents, and treasures for free. And what do I mean by that? The Bible says where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will be. Now, there's a lot of information online about how to build a business by giving away products, giving away services, giving away time. But you should never give away your time, your treasures, or your talent when you lose the heart of the receiver. You should never give away time, treasures, or talent when you lose the heart of the receiver. I am a huge giver. I am a huge giver. But when the person on the other end is not willing to allow that my time, treasure, or talent to cause them something, then I am not going to give them that time, talent, or treasure. And let me see if I can make this real practical for you. There's no one who's given more in life, as we see recorded in Scripture, than the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet you don't see him being controlled by the needs of those around him. He has much to give, but he understands value. And so he says things like, no one can be my disciple unless they're willing to give up something. So you and I live in a world where we think giving means there are no demands on the receiver. And so we think if we give our time, our treasures, and our talents, because the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive, we think, yes, as a minister, I am going to labor more than them all. I'm going to exhaust myself of energy and time and pour myself into others. And then we have nothing left for ourselves or our families. Not wise. Maybe you're in business, you're giving away all of your products and, and services for free, or you're discounting them, thinking that this is a wise thing to do, thinking it's a Christ-like thing to do, and the scripture says, he that deals with a slack hand will come to poverty. When you give away your time, you give away your treasures, you give away your talents, ultimately, especially if you are in business, God says you will come to poverty. And so how do we, how do we solve this? Well, we'll get to the solving in a moment. But what I want to say is the Lord Jesus put demands on everyone who receive anything from him. And if you don't believe this, you're not reading the Bible correctly. I know we have a lot of people that say, come as you are and God will receive you. But that's not true. That is not true. Jesus said to, the, to Zacharias or Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus has lots of possessions and Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I want you to sell all you have and give to the poor. And Zacchaeus, paraphrasing, is willing to do that. And Jesus says, you now have eternal life. Now, did he receive eternal life because he sold all that he had? No, he received eternal life because he showed that he had no idols in his heart. That he had no gods before the God of the Bible. The same thing with the rich young ruler who has the opposite outcome. The rich young ruler comes running down, running to Jesus. Good master, good master, what must I do to gain eternal life? And if Jesus thought like the average teacher, preacher, evangelist in 2018, they would have said, they would have been so excited that he was showing real commitment to want to come. They may have start with, well, how do you understand the law? I doubt many would have done that, but let's say they did. Oh, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, thou shalt uh, not kill, not steal. And he gives six of the Ten Commandments. The average person would have said, great, good job. Uh, say this prayer after me and you will be a Christian. Maybe they would say, give 10% to the poor. Don't forget to tithe. But he was a good Jew, so I suspect he was tithing already. And I mean that in a good sense. He was a good, responsible, orthodox follower of Judaism. And so I suspect that he was tithing. He said, listen, I've kept all these commandments from I was a child. I've obeyed these. Why? Because he had understood from very young that to quote unquote please God, he needed to do certain things. 
And then Jesus said to him, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. Jesus, before he gave him eternal life, put a demand on him to give something in return. He was to give all that he had. My point here is, that which costs nothing is worth nothing. And when you give your time, talents, and treasures to others who don't appreciate or understand the value, if you have lost their heart, you have also lost their commitment. I want to speak for a moment to those who are consultants, those who are coaches. Maybe you're a life coach, you're a health coach, you're a business coach. Often, you give time and energy to others. You're a network marketer. This happens in that industry as well. The person on the other end, if they don't invest anything to receive what you've given, very rarely will they, will they carry out what you are asking them to do. See, if it doesn't cost them nothing, then it's not worth anything. Because why? Where a person's treasure is, that's where their heart will be. Well, I want the heart to be involved because the heart represents soul. It represents energy. It represents time commitment. It represents resolve. It represents passion. When a person's heart's in something, they will follow what you tell them to do. This is why the Bible says things like, you draw near to me with your mouth, but your heart is not near me. God is always concerned about the heart. This is why Colossians 3, 22 and 23 says that we are to serve the Lord heartily. Our heart must be involved. And so if you want to be like God and you are going to give time, treasures, or talents, demand from the receiver that their heart is involved. Demand that they give you eye contact if they're your children and they're asking you for money. Dad, can I have money? No, not if you're not willing to put your phone down. Why? Because if the heart is not involved, there is no real value in the heart of the receiver. And if you and I are being loving to the receiver, the best thing we can do when we're being loving to, re to the receiver is we want the best for the receiver. See, that's what true love is. True love is not just being kind to other people. True love is not just being nice and compassionate to others. True love also demands the best from those who receive. And so once you understand this principle, it affects how you see many of the de demands, the many of the demands that are in Scripture. And so giving away our time, treasures, and talents is unwise when we lose the heart. When we lose the heart. This is why you should not give. I don't think you should, but if you want to do this, it's up to you. It's a free country, free world. You and I can do whatever we want. So with that in mind, this, take the context of what I'm about to say. You have liberty to do whatever you want. But this is why I don't believe in giving to our children. Um, what do they call those things? I think it starts with S. Uh, where parents give money to their children for not without earning it. Uh, somebody help me. Post, um, what is that call again? Uh, you know, parents every uh, week or whatever, they'll give their kids, uh, they'll give them money. And uh, they didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to earn it. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Someone will post it in a moment, and, uh, and I'll confirm the word. The point I'm making to you this morning is this. That which costs nothing is worth nothing. I think some of the worst things you and I can do is let our children receive money without working for it. Good morning, Kenny. Good morning, Allison. Uh, one of you, Darshell, somebody help me out. What's the thing that parents give, when parents give money to their children... Uh, without the child earning it. I think it starts with S. It keeps coming. I, right now, it's in the back of my mind, uh, but, I, but I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, I don't do that with my children. Allowances. Why did I think S? I don't know. Thank you, Allison. You're so smart. Allowances. I think one of the worst things you could do with your children is give them allowances. Here's a side note. The worst thing we can do with a person is make them feel entitled to receiving our time, our talents, and or our treasures. We do this in ministry, where people are upset because you didn't visit me. You're, they're upset because you didn't. No, you have an entitlement mentality, ma'am or sir. Um, children are upset because I couldn't borrow the car. No, not good, not good. And so we have to create demands on people's heart and their consciences so they value what they receive. When you look at the way Jesus did ministry, Jesus always asked people, when they asked him for something, 
whether their heart was in it. Someone comes to Jesus and they say, Lord, please heal my daughter. And Jesus doesn't say, great, I can heal your daughter, let me do it. No, he says, do you believe I can do it? From the heart, do you really believe I can do it? Lord, I do believe, please help my unbelief. Some of them wept before Jesus to, to move him with compassion to, to meet their need. Why? Because the heart should always be involved. And so giving away your time, treasures, and talents is unwise because often you lose the heart of the receiver. Where a person's heart is, that's where, his, where their treasure is, that's where their heart is. And if they're not paying for it in time, talent, or treasure, they don't tend to value your time, your talent, or treasure. Did you, everybody get that? If a person is not paying in time, talent, or treasure, for your time, talent, or treasure, there's a tendency not to value it. This is something that we as Christians who build business with heart can learn from the Jewish community who tend to build business from head. You need to build, you need to marry head and heart together if you want to see God glorified, especially in business, entrepreneur pursuits, and so on. And so, why giving away your time, treasures, and talents is unwise? There's a tendency to lose the heart. Secondly, this I've kind of hinted at it already, we lose value. We lose value. If you're giving away your products and services, and on the other end, nothing is demanded from the receiver, and that's the key, if there's nothing demanded from the receiver, then you lose value. You, they, there's value lost in who you are, there's value loss in your products and services, and on and on I can go. I remember when my brother and I first started producing, writing, and recording music. Uh, with our first album, we used to give away a lot of our music, man. We thought, man, if we just give all this music away, we're doing ministry. God is going to be pleased. What you sow, you will reap. This is going to turn into a huge following. There was no social, me social media then. And we thought, man, many of the churches are going to get excited and they're going to ask us to come and minister the word in song. And uh, uh, this is going to, we didn't know the term viral, but for the sake of, of this discussion, uh, this is going to go viral. And a lot of people are going to be excited about what we're doing because we have the word of God in song and our music is great and it exalts God and it's not entertaining and it's not worldly. And we were sadly surprised. <laughs> what we found is, the people that we gave our music to, in general, most of them, if there was not some demand made upon them, which, were, which allowed us to see their heart showing that they really valued what we were about to give, most of them didn't even use what we gave. I found months later that some of the people never opened the CD. They never listened to it. I would get in people's cars and my CD is sitting there. It's still wrapped up and unpackaged. They didn't understand the value. That which costs nothing is worth nothing. And so when you put no demand on the receiver, when you put no demand on the receiver, what you are giving has little or no value. Again, let me relate it to the gospel. A lot of people are saying to people, come as you are. God expects nothing from you. Well, ask John the Baptist if he believed in that theology. Because a bunch of people come running to John the Baptist in Luke 3 and John chapter 3. And John the Baptist said to these uh, religious leaders, You brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He says, Bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. He put a demand on them. He says, Listen, you soldiers, I'm going to paraphrase, I don't know if I have it exactly. Stop stealing wages from people, and then you can have true salvation. He put a demand on them and expected that they would give up something, that they would repent of something, that they would turn from something. And many of us as God's people are unable to find victory in areas of our life because there are things we never gave up in quote unquote coming to Christ. And so we believe we love the Lord and we are serving him, but we gave up nothing to receive quote unquote the gift of salvation. And we find that we are still in bondage to those things. And so when you give time, talent, and treasure, without demand, you lose value. That which costs nothing is worth nothing. The person doesn't value, generally, your product. 
They don't value your service. I've seen this happen over and over and over again. What I find is the opposite is true. When someone, when you charge, when you charge people money, when you charge premium for your product or services, there's a tendency that the person on the other end will get it done. This is why most people fail in network marketing, because it is too inexpensive to get started. If you were spending two or three million dollars to start a McDonald's, you would eat, sleep, and drink the manuals. You would be at every training session. You would travel to every convention because you, you have to make it work because your treasures are in that. You have invested treasure in that franchise and it has to work or you lose everything that you have, financially speaking. And so here's the principle. That which costs nothing is worth nothing. If you are in business and so on, by the way, if you are a network marketer and you want to create success, the people who will do the most in that industry that you recruit are the people who, in general, invest the most to get started. Those who invest time, those who invest talent, those who invest treasures. When I was really involved with that industry, I used to demand anyone who wanted to be a part of my team, if they didn't have money, they had to work. They had to, they had to do homework. And I would assign something that would take hours for them to do before I even signed them up. Why? Because that's how you know where a person's heart is. The only way to know the heart either is through the speech or to, through time. How a person spends time, treasures, or talents tells us where their heart is. And you want the heart to be engaged or there is no real commitment. So giving away our time, treasures, and talents is unwise because we lose heart. We lose the heart of the receiver. They don't understand our value or the value of our products and services. And lastly, we lose time. Now, I begin by saying that our time is much more valuable and should be. We should see time as much more valuable than, than, than money. And I am still learning this. I've been an entrepreneur, a business owner uh, uh, more, more than 30 years now. As a teenager, a young teen, I've been doing business things. And yet, I have to tell you, I'm still learning this because I'm a heart person. I have a shepherd's heart in general, and I have a tendency to be a huge giver and want to help people, especially those that are in need. But I'm learning more and more that I have to put a demand on people when it comes to my time. Why? Because you can't get time back. And the time you take away to give to someone else for free is time taken away from your family. Time take away, taken away from the things that may be the most important to you. And so when you are going to give away your time, your treasures, and your talents, here is the only time you should do it. So here's the answer to the problem. The only time you and I should give away our time, our talent, and our treasures is when the person on the other end understands and appreciates the value of what's being given. The only time you should give away your time, talents, and treasures is when the person on the other end understands your time, your talent, your treasure, that which you are investing, when they understand and appreciate the value. Two key words, understanding and appreciation. I believe those two words are the key to any and every relationship. It's one thing to understand as a husband that women or your wife is different. She thinks differently. She hears differently. She speaks differently. It's another thing to appreciate that difference. A lot of husbands don't appreciate the difference. We are irritated by the difference. We are angered by the difference. We're bothered by the difference. We don't appreciate it. We want them to be like us. I have been guilty of it often. The key to relationship building in any area of life is understanding and appreciation. And so, when the person on the other end understands and appreciates what's being given, then that's when you give. And what do I mean by that is this. Uh, recently, I was talking to a gentleman. I had a, maybe a 30, 45 minute call with him uh, to help him with his business development. He was launching a business and needed some help from a marketing standpoint and 
wanting to figure out advertising and all these other things. And so after we had spent that time together doing a, a brainstorming session, I call a mastermind session, uh, from a brainstorming standpoint, uh, everything that I do uh, in business is based in scripture. That's what gives me the authority to speak on what I'm telling someone to do. After we were done, I invited this gentleman to drive out to my home. From where he was, it was an hour and a half. And so we, we set up a time for him to come out to my home so we could dig deeper uh, and go through what it was he was seeking to accomplish and see what he would be willing to invest to grow his business. Well, during our session and our time, during that time, uh, you know, I was, in, was encouraging him and, uh, and uh, praising him in one sense for making the time investment. Even though I was investing in him at this point for free, we, we had not negotiated anything. There had been no price given for services or anything or uh, no investment to invest in radio advertising or anything, which is the area that I uh, predominantly work in. And I made a compliment or something along the lines like, you know, I appreciate you making the drive, an hour and a half or whatever it was, to come out to meet with me. And he stopped me and he said, Sean, I want to tell you that if you, after I was done with that conversation with you on the phone uh, a few days ago, he said, if you lived in California, I would have bought a ticket right after our call and I would have flew to California to meet you. And what was his point? The point was he understood the value of what I can provide to him and it, the cost was irrelevant. The cost was irrelevant. So my point here is, and sometimes I will test the person on the other end by saying, you know what, come out and meet me. Make the drive. Set the time at a late hour. I am going to test your resolve to see if you really want to get the results that you say you want to get. Because what I've found from experience, if a person does not have a heart in what they are committing to, they don't follow through. We don't follow through. And so, as I wrap up here, and if any of you have any questions, because I am now looking at my computer, and uh, I don't normally do this, but I'm looking at my computer and I'm seeing uh, that a number of you are on Facebook, and so if you have a question related to this subject, you are in business and you have a challenge, because I meet a lot of Christians, especially in business, who have a challenge with charging premium prices for their products and services who are, are tempted often. I spoke to a lady just two days ago. She knows she's struggling in her business. She knows she doesn't have enough money to advertise. She should be advertising. She knows she should be charging more, but she keeps giving away her services. If you have a question on this matter, if this is a challenge for you, and you want some wisdom, go ahead and ask the question. I'll try to provide something now. I'll even offer to anyone that needs it. If this is a challenge that you have, email me at info at live recession proof now and just mention to me that you'd like a free uh, mastermind or brainstorming session and I'll try to work with you on, on this area. But when you are going to give away your time, your talent or your treasures, make sure that the person on the other end understands and appreciate that value. Make sure they understand and appreciate your time. They understand and appreciate that which you are providing them. And they understand and appreciate your commitment. Study shows that the average person does not read past page 7, I think page 7 of a book. Studies show that most people who invest in programs, whether it's hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, very few use those products and services. Why? One, because we're busy, but sometimes we don't believe or understand the real value there is. Roberta, I minister in jail, homeless shelters, rehabs, counseling, and ministering for no charge. How do I get them to see value in this? Great. So again, uh, we're talking about um, once you understand that treasures or what someone is giving is not just money, what they can give is time, they can give talent or gifting or skill set, 
then you understand how to make or provide demand. And so you think of uh, the book of Acts chapter 2. I think of John and uh, Peter. Peter coming out of uh, the temple and they find the man at the gate who is begging for money. And uh, the response that they give him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. That that man thought that what he needed at the moment was money. He thought that what he needed at the moment was treasures. But they, one, didn't have treasures to give him, but what they had was far more valuable. Because the man needed to walk. And I suspect that if he learned how to walk, he could probably go and earn money so he would not be there begging and homeless. And so one of the things you can demand on, from people is their time. For example, I was in New Orleans uh, uh, last year or the year before. I was in New Orleans, and uh, we're on the main street. I forgot what this main street is called, but there, I was shocked. Beautiful city, but there were some homeless people. So my wife and family and I went into Starbucks, and on the outside we see a homeless man. He looks homeless. He's not properly dressed. I don't know his heart, so I can't say for sure that he was homeless, but I think he was homeless. And so uh, we come out, and we're talking to him, and he's asking for money. Now, he doesn't, on the surface, have anything to be able to give to me, but I tell you what he does have. He has time. And so I test him. He's asking for money. And he wants me to give him money and move on. And often when people ask me for money, I am going to slow down enough and spend a few minutes talking. And if you have a mentality or attitude, one, like you are entitled to my money, then I'm not giving it to you. Why? Because it's not mine anyway. I'm a steward of what God has given me. It's his money. I am going to be held accountable for what I do with what God has given or what God has provided. And so if the person is opened and transparent, and they're willing to have a conversation, and I don't sense that there's an attitude like, can't you just, because I've had some of this, maybe in Newark or New Jersey, uh, I'm sorry, Newark, or, or in Manhattan, where the homeless person has the attitude like, listen, I'm not interested in talking to you, I'm not interested in your gospel, I'm not interested in hearing about God, just give me some money and move on. They don't say those words, but the attitude says, if you're not going to give me, I've even had some say, if you're not going to give me any money, I'm not interested in talking. And so just because a person can't exchange money for money doesn't mean they can't exchange some level of commitment that says to me they value my treasures, my time, my talents. Now, listen, as a young Christian, for maybe the first 10 or 12 or 13, 14, 15 years of my walk with God, I didn't understand what I'm sharing. But I learned to put a demand on the person on the other end so that, it, so that they value what I gave. Give. Sometimes I've said, uh, let me take you inside and I'll buy something with you. And let's sit down together and have a conversation. And if the attitude is like, no, 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 I don't need you to buy it, I'll get it. Then you're probably not going to get my money. Because, one, the only way I know your heart is by what you treasure. By what you are willing to invest in. And so, what I would say, uh, Roberta, you minister in jails, homeless shelters, rehabs, counseling, and ministering for no charge. How do I get them to see value in this? Again, let me give one other practical example. Uh, I used to do a lot of ministry on the streets of New York, a lot of street evangelism, a lot of street preaching. And um, I had an aha moment one day when I was, um, I gave away an expensive Bible. I think this Bible had cost me somewhere between 75 and a hundred dollars. And I had, quote unquote, I led a man to the Lord in prayer. He had said the sinner's prayer. And I felt so good about, you know, this guy being saved and everything. I gave him my Bible. I gave him some tracts. I went away rejoicing. And I was so glad that I had impacted his life and his heart. Now, to be fair, I put no real demands on this man. I didn't expect anything from him to be a Christian. I had some conversation. We talked something about, do you want to go to hell? No. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. You know, you know your situation is messed up and broken. Uh, why don't you say this prayer with me? Do you believe God can save you? Yes, I do. Okay, say this in his prayer with me, and, uh, and God is going to save you. Okay. And we went through this process. I gave him some money. I gave him my Bible. Gave him some tracts. Went away rejoicing. Checked off the mark. Went home saying, Another, I've saved by God's grace, another person's been saved by my efforts. Praise God. A week or two later, I'm walking on Broadway, and guess who I run into? 
Mr. Homeless Man. And guess what Mr. Homeless Man is trying to do to me? He doesn't remember who I am. And Mr. Homeless Man is trying to sell me my own Bible. What I understood at that moment is, number one, what he had committed in prayer and quote-unquote commitment was not a real commitment because there was no real demand on him. See, in my theology then, I didn't understand repentance. The Bible says in Hebrews 6 that the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ is first repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the laying on of hands and it gives us the six elementary principles that are the foundation of being a child of God. It begins with repentance. And so here is this man trying to sell me my own Bible and I walked away with a broken heart, feeling ashamed and now assessing all of my evangelistic efforts before I begin to question how many of the people who had made a confession or a profession of faith had not meant what they said. Their mouth word, worded certain things, but their heart wasn't involved with it. And so that sent me on the search. And for the next six months or year, I began to read biographies. I began to read evangelism books. I began to read everything I could on revival. And my theology began to change. And I realized that which costs nothing is worth nothing. And the cost to come to Christ is repentance. We must give up our life as a disciple, just to begin the process of being a disciple. And so what did I learn from that? I learned that just because someone is in need, just because someone is homeless, doesn't mean that nurturing is what they need. What they need is discipline. They need discipleship. Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. He doesn't say make a distinction if they have less, if they're abased, if they're in jail, if they're homeless. The demands on them should be the same. And the demand is not that I expect you to give me money. I don't need your money. What I need is to know that you value what I'm sharing with you. How many times have you poured your time and energy, I'm saying for myself, into the person in prison, into the person in jail, and they devalue what's given? We need God's wisdom to know how to maneuver through and in these things. What I would say, Roberta, is the great thing about Scripture is the Bible says we pray for those who despitefully use us. At times, love will, in being vulnerable, it's going to be used. It's going to be taken advantage of. And when we are doing ministry, uh, that's part of the process. But much of what I'm sharing is more for those who are doing business, those who are entrepreneurs, those who have a tendency to give away what they have, thinking that they are going to create greater and better results and that it's more pleasing to God. And my point here is, when giving away our time, treasures, and talents, it becomes unwise. When we lose the heart of the individual, we lose the value and the time. Remember God in Deuteronomy 8 says, Israel, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you everything you need as far as possessions. But I have a concern that as you receive more from me, my concern is that I will lose your heart. And he says, remember, it is God that gives you power to get wealth. The context of that text or that scripture is that I don't want you to forget me when you have been given certain things. And the principle there for us is we don't want people's heart to be lost in the process, which is their commitment. And even though someone may not be able to give us money for our time, talents, or treasures, they can give us time. They can give us talent, skill. Someone may be homeless. You know, I had a guy that I met that was homeless. I asked him, what are your skill sets? I used to paint. I can do such and such. I don't, I don't know. You know, the person may be homeless for a number of reasons. I'm not going to judge why you're homeless. Just because you're homeless doesn't mean you don't have some skill sets. And so I start to talk to this guy about, well, maybe you can come and paint for me. And there's dignity, by the way, in work. I was talking to my daughter yesterday, and I'll end here. My 10-year-old, we were talking about uh, work, and she says, you know, she wants to be a, uh, oh, you hear me talking about you. Hi, how you doing? Good. Good morning. You just woke up? Yeah. It's kind of late no, to not, just wake up. Well, huh? not really. I was drawing over there. You were drawing? Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want people to see you on camera? Yeah. Okay, just, you got to fix your hair first? Oh, my goodness. So, uh, everybody, this is uh, Jasmine. Say hello. 
So okay. Jasmine's goal in life is she wants to be an Olympian. She wants to be a gymnast. And we're, by God's grace, trying to train her athletically. She gave me four things you want to do. She says, if, I don't, if I'm not an Olympian, you want to do what? What's the second thing? If, I don't, if I'm not a gymnast. Well, if you're not a gymnast, you want to do what? Track. Track. Athlet, athletics. So what's the third? WNBA. WNBA. So basketball. Uh -huh. I've never seen you play basketball at all in ten year, and you're 10. Uh -huh. But that doesn't mean it's not possible. And what's the fourth thing? Soccer. So here she is. All of these are athletic stuff. And so her and I are having this discussion yesterday. And Daddy's like, yeah, but, you know, that, that can't, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, I, I'm optimistic. Pursue it. Go after it with all your heart. But you need to also have other things. And the point here is work. And I was sharing with her that you need to work. And, and the mindset was sort of like, well, you know, I don't really want to have a job and do those things. And... And I'm going to say, I wouldn't say who, but somebody told me that if I'm an Olympian and I'm this and that, I'll never have to work um, ever. And I said, no, that's not the mindset you want to have. And the point I was making to her, I said, work is a spiritual action. Work is important. It's, it's, it's important for people to work because work provides dignity. Work makes us feel like we've accomplished something. God has wired us to receive for work. And this is why the Bible makes it a moral issue that when and if someone works, they should be paid. The laborer is worthy of their hire. The Bible says the ox that treads the coin is worthy of, uh, it should be paid. And so if I was working with homeless people, and you can't do this with everybody, I'm going to try to find some way for them to get dignity by giving something. They, they may not have money to give, they're homeless, they don't have some place to live, they don't even have a job. But it doesn't mean you can't paint, doesn't mean you can't cut the lawn, doesn't mean you can't do something. I want to find out what are your skill sets. And I believe this is what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is very costly, and a lot of our evangelism efforts in, in general are not effective long term. Studies show that, that much of what Billy Graham has done over the years, from an evangelistic standpoint, the fruit is not there. A lot of the people today are not walking with God. And you know, you and I meet them on the streets, and many of them are strung out on drugs, alcohol, and other things, and you begin to talk to them about Christ and try to put a demand on them for Christ, and what do they do? I'm a Christian. I was a Christian in 1979. I went to a Billy Graham crusade, and I gave my heart to the Lord. There's no fruit in their life. There's nothing that demonstrates they've been changed by the grace of God. But somehow because they walked the aisle or made a profession or said something to God as far as a profession, they believe they're a child of God. This creates a lot of problems for us. And this is all connected to my subject. Where there's no demand on the receiver in time, treasure, or talent, there is little value from the perspective of the receiver of the time, treasure, and talent that you're giving. I hope you found something here valuable. Thank you for joining me this morning for daily, what is it called? Money Matters to God Saturday. This is the second one I've done. If you're interested in, 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 in um, hearing the one that I did last week, uh, just use the hashtag Money Matters to God Saturday. Lord willing, tomorrow, Sundays, I do Music Matters to God Sunday, and those are usually 7.30 a.m. every morning. Sometimes I broadcast from my Live Recession Proof Now page. Other times I broadcast from my personal page, depending on how I feel. Um, you can also get access to all of this content on YouTube, if you like. God bless you all. Thank you for your comments, your questions. I read them all later. And I hope you guys have a good day. Please repeat or write your email address. Thank you. That's uh, Darshel. Darshel, you're asking me to repeat or, or my, my email address? Oh, my email is uh, use info at Live Recession Proof Now. Live Recession Proof Now is a book. Well, there are two books that I'm writing related to this subject. And I'll end here by just saying this. Uh, I believe a major recession is coming. Uh, I thank God for the way econo ec economically we are right now. But I believe uh, there's a mandate for us as God's people to live recession-proof now so that we position ourselves uh, to be a trusted advisor to the world who is um, in despair during the downturn in our economy. And we live recession-proof now by doing four things. Number one, we learn how to live on less than we make. 
That's discipline. So it takes self-denial. Number two, we responsibly pay off our debts. Responsibly. Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, lots of people teach how to pay off debts. I don't think they all do it or teach God's people to do it in a responsible way. I don't think you should pay off debt without saving. Thirdly, you should produce multiple streams of income. And so the point here is, if you pay yourself first in step number two, that assumes that you're tithing, all right, then now you have to make more money because most people have more expenses than they do have resources at the end of the month. There's usually more time at the end of the month for many people than there is money. And so step three teaches us how to produce multiple streams of income. I don't think it's wise to only have one income stream. You should not live in a way that when you get fired on your job, your world comes to an end. Not wise. Not wise. You should have posture. Your job should understand that you have value to give to that job. But your life does not consist on that job. Because you have talents, gift, and time that can be invested to create more revenue for you. Like the Proverbs 31 woman. Who learned how to make clothes. She learned how to be a real estate investor. She found land and invested in it. She, and on and on. If you read Proverbs 31. You will see that she had multiple streams of income. And the fourth step in the Live Recession Proof Now uh, program. Is um, developing a heart. The right type of heart. Once you make money. You need to learn how to give it properly. And so you need to nurture a heart of generosity. 1 Timothy 6.17 says. Let those who are rich. Be rich in good works. All right? You need wisdom when you have more to know how to spend, how to invest, and so on. So welcome again to um, Money. Thank you. Money Matters to God, sat Saturday. And uh, Monday through Friday, I do daily nuggets of wisdom where I seek to share a nugget of wisdom, something you can walk away with and use in daily life. By God's grace, I seek to make it very practical. And uh, I want to thank you regulars who tend to join me every day. Okay? I'm going to leave you with, the Bible has answers for every area of life. I'm a student of lots of books. I try to read at least a book a week, if not more. But, nothing substitute for the, my time in the Bible. Nothing. Because the Bible has the answers for what you should eat and how you should eat. How you should take care of your body. The Bible has answers on how you should parent your children. The Bible has answers on... Uh, music and ministry, what we should listen to, what we should avoid. The Bible has answers on how we should build strong marriages. The Bible gives us answers on how, who to date, how to date, the process. The wisdom is the principal thing, Scripture says. My phone keeps freezing. I'm going to end here. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, Scripture says. And in all of our getting, we should get understanding. Thank you for joining me this morning for Money Matters to God Saturday. God bless you all. Good to see you, uh, uh, Anissa, all the way from the Bahamas. And uh, Roberta, thank you for your question. And, uh, you know, always err on the side of love. But remember that Jesus, the Bible doesn't say Jesus was filled with love. The Bible says Jesus was filled with grace and truth. Grace has demands. Grace is not plastic. Grace, grace has teeth. And so the Bible says in Titus 2, verse 11... That the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And as you read the rest of the text, you see that the grace of God puts a demand on the receiver. All right? So the principles I'm giving you, I'm not just making these up. It's taken me 20 plus years of trial and error and failure, failed businesses, failed entrepreneurial pursuits, failed ministries and different things to figure some things out and understand that the Bible has the answers for everything in life. The Bible is filled with tension, and the key to understanding the tension and when we should do what, and when we should do what, because sometimes it seems like it's contradicting itself, we need the Spirit of God who provides us the wisdom of God to know what steps to take and when. God bless you guys, and thank you for joining me for today's Money Matters to God Saturday. And you know what? Jasmine, I'm going to start, uh, I'm trying to train Jasmine to be an entrepreneur, and uh, we have three goals in life, and what are those three goals? Have the character of Jesus. you got to speak up so they can hear you. What? Have the character of Jesus. So we're, we're trying to develop, we're going to make sure that you learn to develop the character of Jesus, that's one. Number two? The emotions.
modest woman. You're going to learn how to be a chaste and modest woman. So you're not a, a temptress. Number three, what's the third one? Um, to be a leader. And to be a leader and not a what? Follower. Not a follower. So in the Isaac song, we don't believe in peer pressure. We don't believe in peer pressure, do we? There's no such thing as peer pressure unless it's coming from your end. You are the pressure to the culture. And so what you believe and what you teach your children, that's exactly what they will live out. And so what I'm seeking by God's grace to do is to teach Jasmine and Lily. Jasmine's going to be 11. Lily is 6. To be a leader and not a follower. Scripture says all we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep are followers. Sheep are followers. I'm glad it's not the only description for the child of God in the Bible. You don't have to be a follower all your life. The spirit of being a follower is what we should possess. We should have a spirit of a follower, which means we're not arrogant and haughty, but we should not be dominated and weak so that the culture and society controls what we say and what we do. And that's the tension that we seek and try to develop, right? Yeah. All right, cool. You seem nervous. You're normally more bold than you are on camera. No, because while you were talking, I was making funny faces. You were making funny faces? Was anybody laughing? I don't know. I Guys, don't... have a good day. Enjoy your family. Time is short. We don't know how much time we have with our children. And so, God bless you guys. And again, lastly, thanks for hanging out with me today for uh, I mean... Money Matters. And, and thank you for hanging out with Jasmine. For Money Matters to who? God. Money Matters to God, Saturday. God bless you all. Bye.